Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a review on our traditional Filipino weapons, Moro Compilon. Now, there's a couple things I need to note before I go into the review, as I normally do, and that is some biases, things you need to hear me say aloud before you hear me say other things aloud. So, first and foremost, this was a new piece from traditional Filipino weapons. I believe it would actually came from Call of Athena, though. It was purchased by a fellow sword friend, Corey, who had it sent to me so that I could do a review for it first before he ever got to play with it. So, Corey, first, thank you. Uh, for sending this to me so that all of us sword friends can maybe learn uh, a little bit about it. Um, but uh, yeah, this will be going back to Corey, which means I'm not going to break it in half or anything like that. I'm going to do some general tests and things like that. And, uh, and there's that. But it should be a good example of what you should expect new from traditional Filipino weapons if you were to buy one. The second thing I need to note is that I am a practitioner of Filipino martial arts. I'm a little bit out of practice, but I did study a little bit of how to use the Compilon or how to use the Compilon. And uh, I'll admit though that I am not an expert, I'm not a guru, I'm not a teacher, I'm not an instructor. I'm just a guy that has a passion for the martial art and I, I like it and I, I was interested in the long sword or largo techniques. Um, so I, I did study a little bit about how to use the Compilon, but just know, admittedly I'm no expert. You can make fun of me and laugh at me as you see me cut if I'm doing anything wrong. I'd appreciate it if you shared what I should be doing better uh, so that everyone can, can benefit from that knowledge. But just know this is not an instructional video and I am not advocating that the way I do it is the right way. The last thing I need to note is that there are some biases I have about traditional Filipino weapons. I've owned a myriad of the products and I haven't really been dissatisfied with any of them, but I have seen how the owner interacts with his patrons and how he advertises some things on Facebook and admittedly I get a little sour grapes about some of it. So I'll talk about that in the end section because it's not really relevant to the sword itself, but uh, I will talk about it and just know that it might influence my opinion. I'm, I'm not a super big fan of some of the advertising that they've done uh, or some of how they've contributed to some conversations with their patrons. Uh, it's, it's rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. So anyway, I'm going to move on with the review now that you have those caveats. So a little bit about the Compilon. Now, the Compilon is not something I'm going to cover in a great historical context, but there are some things that I think are worth noting. Uh, this review is actually coming off the coattails of an episode of Forged in Fire, which featured the Compilon. According to legend, the Compilon was the sword that killed explorer Ferdinand Magellan at the Battle of Mactan in what is now the Philippines. The heavy spur-tipped sword was used by island warriors in battle and could chop off two heads in one swing. In that episode, they highlighted a few things, and I, you know, I think they did a good job, and the Compilon isn't something a lot of people uh, have seen before. It's certainly not a super popular type of sword, and when mass production models come out, they oftentimes go by the wayside in, in relatively short order. It's not a model or a type of sword that's as easy to find as the, the Gion or the Dao or the Katana or the Wakazashi or the Long Sword or any of those variations. Uh, it's a little less common to, to find, and so this example I think is one of the few that's actually commercially available. Traditional Filipino Weapon says they're out of stock right now. They retail for $270. Cult of Athena, though, is a distributor for Philippi traditional Filipino Weapons, and it looks like they have some there. Now, as a point of reference, here are two additional Compilon, one from Chris Cutlery, which I think may use the same forge as traditional Filipino weapons, and one from uh, Hanway, back when they used to make them. There's some notes, the Hanway one, actually, the handle seems uh, backwards compared to uh, the, the other Compilon that I have. This alligator mouth points the, the other way. Um, but neither one of these are made anymore, and when they were made, I think they were probably a little bit less expensive than traditional Filipino weapons piece, but not by necessarily a long shot. I remember about uh, seven or eight years ago, I got this Compilon for 120 bucks on sale, but I think it was 200 or 240 at the time, and I'm not sure about the Hanway piece. It went out of stock before I ever got interested in Compilon, so I, haven't, I have no idea what this piece used to sell for, but it's a, a piece from Hanway, and if they were both available, I think it's just a point of consideration that I've, I, I think about them as they were available, even though realistically traditional Filipino weapon seems to be the only one that you can buy as the making of this review on August 2017. Or geez, it's September 2017 now. A little bit more about the Compilon itself. So typically they have this large alligator mouth on them. I don't know exactly why. You could use it one-handed or two-handed. Uh, sometimes there's horse hair or human hair or something else on this side of the Compilon that comes off. Why that exists, I'm honestly not 100% sure. I've heard people say that they would put some 
bits of powder or, or poison or chilies or something in there and smack somebody in the face with them. Or maybe it was used like the ribbon on a geon as a, as a distraction or like the ribbon on a spear. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Um, the handle is often made of wood. This one has a pin in it and a rattan wrap. Sometimes they have had rattan wraps on them. Sometimes I've seen them bound in some sort of uh, cloth or, or twine. Uh, I don't often see a pin in historic examples though. If I do, it's usually towards the bottom and I don't know if it's added later, but I don't often see a pin uh, in Compulon, at least not right up on the handle here like this one is. They do often have a wooden handguard, though historic examples have what's called a staple in them, or at least some of them do, which is a large kind of metal ring that goes in there and supposedly bits of leather or a leather strap or a chain mail would be draped over the staple. This is an example of the staple and a chain mail would be draped over it or a, a strap of leather or something as a added measure of hand protection. Now personally I haven't seen examples that have the leather left over or chain mail but I have seen examples that have the staple though any modern production piece that I see doesn't have a staple so I don't I don't know exactly uh, why they're not on there, but they're they're not. Um, and it wasn't actually mentioned in the Forged in Fire episode either, so I don't know what to think about that. But nevertheless, the staple is another part on a compilon that is uh, that is an important bit, as the historic examples have had it. Then the blade profile is usually a bit thinner at the base. It widens out. Oftentimes, the examples that I have historically have uh, a point of balance of about seven or eight inches on the historic examples. Uh, they vary in length. The longest one I have is about four inches longer than this, and uh, they all have this barb. Sometimes the barbs have more barbs on them, and then there's also some decoration. Sometimes Tampilon will have a lot of intricate decoration along them. Uh, they might have little barbs or decorative barbs along the spine. The handles will be, uh, you know, engraved and carved in, in such a way that's very elegant and ornate. Uh, this one doesn't have any of that, but this one is also $270. The other bit I'll note about geoma geometry differences that I'll touch on a little bit is this one has kind of a central ridge section. Uh, it's a little bit hollow ground along the flat, and then there's another bevel towards the edge. And all the examples of historic pieces I've seen are flat. They have kind of an apple seed edge, but there's no beveling or ridges that exist on the Compulon. I haven't seen historic examples like that. And if you have, uh, share them in the description down below or in the comments down below, because it'd be interesting for all of us sword friends to learn together. Now, in terms of how a Compulon is used, I only know the way I learned to use it. Supposedly you can use it two-handed thusly, but I never, I never did. Um, the way I learned is if you were starting, you fed it kind of from the shoulder, you would point the butt of the weapon at the enemy's eyes so they couldn't see how long it was, you, you'd fling it. Uh, and anytime I used my second hand or my off hand, it'd be to catch the compulon or stop the motion if I really put gusto behind it, and then to push off, to feed, to add additional momentum from my second hand to get the blade uh, in, in motion quickly again. And often the Compulon, as I learned it, wasn't used in this kind of long distance, kind of keep the big stick between me and my opponent for, for range and to kind of keep it pointed at the enemy's face. It would be in constant motion and, and moved around and I would try to learn to quickly strike uh, from any position in this kind of free form flowing of the Compulon. It one, kept my hand uh, at, avoided as a, as a target in sparring, but two, um, I, I don't know, that's just the way I learned to use it realistically. So that was, that was the trick, but everything that I learned to do was one-handed. So you could use it two-handed, but everything I learned to do was one-handed. Anyway, that's a little bit about what I know about the Compulon. I'm not gonna go into any more of the history of it because I don't really know it. It's a lot harder sword to research, and if you have any insert information, if you're an expert in it, uh, throw some information in the commentary below. It would be good to learn more about it. Now, in terms of reviewing this particular sword, what I can say is that the woodwork is uh, got some interesting bevels and planing and, and, and just overall how you see the grain. It's, it's pretty good. It's $270 and I don't expect anything ornate, but for what it is, it's good, it's solid, and it has some detail, which makes it kind of handsome in its own right. The handle is rattan wrapped and initially little bits and chunks were kind of coming off in my hand. Little, uh, little pieces of the, the rattan, little fibers were kind of coming off in my hand. That hasn't happened anymore. It might have just been the initial use that had to had to be gotten over, um, and now it seems that it's it's pretty stable. I imagine it'll stabilize more over time, and then eventually kind of probably come undone and need to be rewrapped. Uh, the cross guard is made of wood and is thick. It doesn't have a staple. It's wide, and it seems relatively similar to the historic examples I've seen. Uh, 
Uh, the gripe that I might have about it is that the handle is round. In the historic examples I'm able to find, and the ones that in my, are in my collection, and the examples I've seen in others' collections, don't have round handles. The modern reproductions, both the Hanway and the Chris Cutler, have round handles, and I don't, I don't know why. It looked like the pieces on Forged and Fire had round handles as well. Um, I don't know why people are doing that, because indexing the blade is really important to know where the edge is, especially if you're using it like I am in this goofy, kind of free-flowing... Uh, thing you got to know where your edge is really easily at all times and and this old you know rounded handle makes that hard It's got a mildly oval shape and it does have a slight taper to it But I still find it kind of difficult to index on the blade the pokey pokey stabby part uh, A couple things to note one is you can make out a lot of milling marks in the polish Not bad for 270 bucks the flats of the blade are all sorts of wibbly wobbly and I see some curls and whatnot and this this central ridge kind of wanders a little bit again for $270 I don't think that's necessarily a deal breaker one other small bit of note about the blade is that it came with some small little swirls of rust and uh, I find that kind of sad personally that it came with little bits of rust I wiped away it was in a lot of oil so I don't know how the rust came to form on the oil anyway but uh, a small application of Mother's Mag hasn't really removed it, it's still stained on there. And the fact that it came with any, any bits of rust on it at all, even for 270 bucks, I find kind of disappointing. Um, I don't know if this was just around for a long time, or I, I, I can't make... I don't know. But it came rusted, and darn it, I think that that's sad. The geometry, though, is interesting. As I mentioned, I don't see historic examples that are like this. But one particular thing I find interesting, I don't necessarily dig the secondary bevel, but this flat section here appears hollow ground. And I'm guessing it is because this is very light for how uh, kind of big and imposing it is. Uh, the historic examples are usually a bit heavier than this, and if this hollow ground section is intentional, which I'd like to think it is, it's, it's a small hollow grind, but it's definitely there, uh, it's suffice it, it's doing a lot to, to lower the thickness, or rather the weight of the blade, comes in at two pounds, one ounce for this sword, and uh, the Hanwei is about the same, but it's it's a much smaller looking blade. It's, I think it's actually an ounce lighter. Uh, the Chris Cutlery version is uh, about uh, six ounces heavier than this. It's two pounds, six ounces. And the heaviest historic Compulon I have is two pounds, nine ounces. So uh, this is kind of within reason. It's within the realm. Of, of the historic blades that I have. The other blades are a little bit heavier by a couple ounces, the ones that are at least in the same size category. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little lighter. And dynamically, it's it's comfortable to move around. And it's it's nice, it feels like it's supposed to. Now, Compulon, typically, all of the versions I have, have a point of balance that's between seven and eight inches, at least if we're going historically. This one's closer to eight inches in terms of the point of balance. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's within historic realms for the Compulon that I'm comparing it to, both in terms of weight and balance properties. Uh, it's comfortable to move around, at least as comfortable as a Compulon is. This is not exactly the most user-friendly shape, admittedly, but for how a Compulon is supposed to move, this one is among the more comfortable. And I do ad admire kind of the uh, attempt to do a hollow ground thing for 270 but I, it, The dynamic properties of this I, I do find kind of interesting. It's certainly a, a no-frills approach. It's not uh, trying to be overwhelmingly aesthetically pleasing, but for, for what they did and what they deliver, I, I think it's, it's a very compelling offer. Now, if I look at the barb on here, the, the interesting bit about the barb, it falls in line with the historic pieces I have. Uh, it prevents you really from stabbing, but supposedly the barb is used for hooking, and if you're familiar with uh, historic European martial arts, half-sorting isn't going to be a stranger to you. And so using this barb to grab things and move people around in closer ranges, though, I don't think this is big enough to do anything like that with, though it's along the realm of historic stuff. If the barb were bigger and came out in more of a hook, I could see doing something like that. Uh, this really just seems to prevent me from using the weapon to stab any deeper than would irritate somebody or potentially be damaging. Um, so I don't know if it's if it's there to prevent. I don't really know what it's for. I was told to to grab to hook, and I didn't learn any techniques that really use that. So I don't I don't know how to apply it, and it doesn't seem big enough to be effective to me. Though if you have some information, throw it in the commentary below. I'm just going to add the note that this one seems to be uh, close to the historic versions that I'm able to find. Uh, Compulon might also have, you know, more barbs that are decorative and uh, engraving and all sorts of... This is just a very pragmatic and very practical uh, delivery of a Compulon. It, it's kind of... 
it's got some aesthetic properties that are, are, are pleasing, but really uh, not a lot of engraving or extra detail to add to the aesthetics. Though, you know, in and of itself, I think it's a handsome sword. Another thing to look at on the sword is the scabbard. And I think this is, I don't know, let's call it a scabbard, but kind of a shipping container. So uh, one, it does hold it, but it's because it's bound somewhere in there. Oh, and a bunch of stuff came out. Uh, it has some pings and dings kind of right from the factory, and that is not necessarily super appealing, but, you know, not terribly, I don't know. For 270 bucks, my expectations are tempered, and I'm not necessarily going for perfection. A thing I should note about the scabbard is supposedly the Compilon was made where uh, it could cut through the scabbard with very little resistance to be drawn quickly. Now, as a student of Japanese martial arts, drawing quickly and, and cutting in kind of one motion is, uh, is a big part of the martial art, and this doesn't seem to fulfill that, uh, and I don't know that it necessarily has to. I never studied that portion of Compulon usage. It was already, you know, from a drawn weapon, um, so I don't really know how to do that, and it's not something I practiced, but this certainly would not facilitate the historic way where it would cut through the bits of rattan uh, and be able to be drawn out immediately. But it does do the job. It rattles a little bit, and you can see there's some sawdust that comes out of it, but Meh. I got a chance to swing the sword around a little bit before I actually smacked it into something, and my impressions are actually pretty good. I hadn't swung a Compilon around, admittedly, in a few months prior to doing this little video, and what I found is that dynamically the blade is very comfortable. Now, I'm putting up some additional notes from the Sword Dynamics computer, and it's my first time putting a Compilon in. I got some very interesting readings from the computer, but you can see it's, it's a very tip-heavy weapon. It moves forward, it wants to chop. I will note that in this dynamic computer, I'm going to link the, the bits in the description below, I put the lever reference pretty high because I use it one-handed, um, but that may not necessarily be the case. If you change the lever reference, it changes the dynamic properties a little bit. Uh, I put the lever reference at, you know, basically disregarding the whole wooden kind of uh, alligator portion at, at the base, the pommel area, if you will. Anyway, uh, dynamically, I thought it was actually pretty pretty easy to move around. It's on the light side. It's a very tip-heavy, hard weapon to move around. It's quite a bit like a baseball bat in that regard. But it's still, you know, as a Compulon is, I found it relatively comfortable to move. The trick I find in moving the Compulon is that it's, compared to other swords, a little less forgiving about starting and stopping motion. As it's tip-heavy, the way I learned to move it is kind of tossing it off my shoulder and keeping it in motion. But if you want to admittedly use two hands or put gusto behind it, that, that motion, that tip-heavy feeling is really kind of hard to start and stop. Uh, so I had to use my offhand to kind of get it moving and, and get the flow of things going. But admittedly, they're not super comfortable weapons to use. Inherently, I remember picking up a Compulon the first time and I thought it was just this kind of clumsy, goofy feeling blade. but. After you get it moving around, it, it becomes more comfortable, but it's it's a learned technique. I don't. It, it's not necessarily the most comfortable weapon inherently to move around, and that may be why they're not a, a terribly popular selling variety of sword. And in terms of use, I cut water bottles with it. I found the blade difficult to index, and that's really maybe the only complaint I can make is that. Uh, this little pin pops out and kind of bites my fingers just enough to, to irk me, but I found it difficult to index. Not necessarily so much on kind of the general 45 degree and kind of direct downward strikes, but if I was doing an upward angle, um, I found that a lot more difficult to, to index and hit. I, I just ended up batting the stuff around. Now that could be because I'm not that great at cutting in general, but I did find it a little harder to find the edge alignment uh, well in, in those strikes. Um, and so a, a handle that was maybe a more oval shape would, would be appreciated. Everything else is actually pretty good. It cut really, really well. 
Um, it was easy to move around. It was comfortable. Uh, I didn't feel out of control. It was easy to, to do what I needed to do with it. And in terms of cutting to Tommy, it was like a laser beam. Um, and I didn't, that really caught me off guard. I thought that the secondary bevel was going to make cutting to Tommy and cutting in general uh, hard. The sharp edge, is, the fact that it's really, really sharp is positive. Um, but I did not expect it to do that well into Tommy, and it did. And that really surprised me. The other Compulon that I have cut with have all actually cut exceptionally well. They are um, very, very capable cutting weapons, um, but I thought that this bevel would be more of a problem than it was. However, they designed this geometry. Uh, hollow ground blades also don't often do very well for me for cutting, but this did an excellent job cutting. I really have absolutely no complaints. The other thing I can note is that this blade has already been used for cutting and you can see just how sharp it is. Now I'm not an expert at cutting paper either, uh, for some reason I find it kind of difficult, but you can see that it's it's moving, there's no burrs or anything that are catching on the edge here. It's really a, a suitably sharp blade and it's uh, maintained its edge profile quite well. I'm, I'm actually really pleased with how well, it performed. It did well. Uh, it, yeah, it was just all sorts of fun to cut with this thing with. And it's dynamically a little bit more fun for me to move this around than it is the Chris Cutlery piece, which is what I've trained with for a long time. So uh, now that uh, I have to send this one back to Corey, I'm kind of tempted even more so now to buy one for myself. Anyway, yeah, what do I think about it? For $270, it's not a small amount of money, but it's not substantial really either. Uh, I think this is a great learning tool. If you're a person that studies Compulon, if you're looking for one, I think this is a really good example. If the bevel from a historic perspective doesn't bother you, uh, then cutting wise, it shouldn't impact your performance. And dynamically, I think it's, it's a very compelling while still being pretty accurate to dynamic properties of its historic predecessors. Uh, I think it does a good job. So yeah, for $270, I don't really see a problem with it. Now I'm keeping that in mind as I compare it to the other ones that hypothetically were available, but the realistic scenario we're in right now is that there are very few Compulon available for purchase. A traditional Filipino weapon seems to be about the only one. If you know of another option, uh, please link it in the commentary down below, but the Hanway piece is no longer produced and maybe they come up secondhand, but they're, they're quite rare. Uh, the Chris Cutlery piece is also not produced and not available on their website, and it might come up secondhand, but again, it's probably pretty rare. Uh, and I don't see other Compulon on the market other than this, so uh, this is your only option. Good thing, though, is that it seems to be a good one, and if I had the three to choose from, the Chris Cutlery, the Hanway, or this, uh, as a learning tool, I, I would choose this. I admittedly like the profile of the Chris Cutlery a little bit more, but it's heavier. Uh, I like the look of the wood a little bit more in the Chris Cutlery, but I like the rattan wrap and the extra detailing here. So for the money, I think I think this is a really strong candidate. And if worth the other two were available, I think I would still choose this. The last option that's available to you is a historic blade, and I think you can find antique Compulon for between you know two hundred and seven hundred dollars. And I think you can find some antique Compulon on Chris Cutlery's website actually, uh, but they're on eBay. They come up for sale from time to time, but. I would use some caution if you're gonna use it. One, you might wanna have an antique rehilted because they often have worn and are not great. And at the cutting parties and events that I've gone to where historic Filipino blades are used in a, in a cutting practice, it's not uncommon. I've seen it where the, the blade will come out of the handle because whatever resin or glue or thing is used to hold it together has come undone. Maybe it had an iron pin, but it's worn away or come undone. Um, in any case, you might want to double check and make sure that the hilt is suitable for you to actually have cutting, uh, cutting practice with if you're going to use a historic blade. The other thing is the blade might be a little worse for wear. It could have been heated and cooled. It could be cracked. There could be some sort of impact that would cause the blade to break and become a helicopter of death. And those are all things that you need to bear in mind if you're using really any sword, but they become a little bit more of a potential variable if you're using a historic or an antique. So just make sure that it's in suitable condition to be used. But I think an antique with a, re, with a redone hilt or, or an antique that is 
been inspected and, and, and you are, have some assurances that it's suitable for practice might be another option. They're not wildly expensive. They haven't increased in price the same way that, say, antique Japanese or antique medieval European arms have. So you can still get them at, at pretty reasonable prices and you might be able to find somebody to do this kind of woodwork or maybe you're handy yourself and can do it. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's another option that's worthy of exploring, especially if you're trying to swing it at air and you're mostly doing drills in places where it's safe to do those types of things. Uh, I think an antique would probably be uh, perhaps more suited. And the reason I say that is this big old beast uh, right here. So this is a, an antique, but it's about four inches longer. It's about eight ounces heavier, but just the, the profile and how it moves, I think is maybe a little bit more historic. I do have antique Compulon that are the same size as uh, the TFW Compulon, but I like the longer version personally. Um, and these seem to be things that you're more likely to find in antiques. Uh, also, you can get some more ornate carving. You can see that the, the handle is coming undone a little bit. Um, but I, you know, I would, I would think personally, I would, if I was going to spend money on a Compulon and I wanted something a little fancier, I'd look for something that still had some of the barbs and ornate work on it. And I'd see if I could find a craftsman that would be willing to, to rehilt it for me. The last option you might have is to contract a, another smith to make a Compulon, though admittedly I don't know a lot of people that make Compulon or Filipino blades in a custom way at all. Uh, though the episode on Forged and Fired showed that at least two new custom Compulon are in existence, uh, I don't know that the blade profile is exactly what I would be looking for, but uh, you could maybe work with a custom smith to design something that's exactly the way you want. Anyway. Uh, the point was to review this traditional Filipino weapons compilant, and for what it is, I think it's a very compelling offer, and I am super stoked that I got to play with it. This was a really fun blade to cut with, and so I'd, I'd encourage you, if you are in the market for a compilant, to look at this one. I think it's a very solid option. The last bit that I'm going to note is um, why I have some sour grape feelings about traditional Filipino weapons, and there's really, there's a few issues that I hear about in the community, but there's really just two of them that come to mind. Uh, first and for, well, first and not foremost, but uh, is the question of steel usage. So TFW advertises this as 5160 and D2, and there is some speculation that it may just be 5160 or a different similar steel, but that it is not a proprietary mixture of these types of steels because for some science reason that's unlikely. I don't really know enough about metallurgy or the science behind it to make a compelling argument, but I would say as a consumer, the online debate between TFW's, you know, kind of Facebook presence and the groups and the questions that are asked and the accusations that are made and the answers to those accusations have left me with a lot more questions and more doubt than rather reassurance and answers. Um, I don't really know what the impact is or who bears the burden of proof in this argument, but I, I haven't necessarily been satisfied by the argument. I didn't know it was an argument until I read a complaint and then I didn't it just left me with questions, I guess. I wasn't satisfied with how TFW addressed the issue online. And since I don't have it screenshotted, I can just say that that's my personal opinion about it. Um, what does it impact though? I don't know. Either way, this is a really good sword and it did a really good job cutting. And I think it's a really good value for $270, regardless of what it's made from. If it's made from, I don't, if it's made from aluminum and it's not a hardened metal, it, it's held an edge really well. I don't really care what it's made from. It did a good job. So that's, from a consumer standpoint, I, I'm really pleased with the performance, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know the validity of the argument. I do know though that there is, I guess, a moral, uh, a moral question of is it false advertising? Are you just saying something to try and get people to buy stuff because you think it makes you special? I, I don't know. I don't know how to how to answer that argument, and I don't know who's responsible for answering it. But I would just say that as a consumer, I don't know. The the whole thing kind of rubs me the wrong way. The other thing that I find unsatisfying, and I think is maybe the biggest issue for me, is how TFW has used women in some of their advertising. I'm, I don't think of myself as a terribly prudish person, and it's not because I'm the father of a daughter or that I respect my wife or the female practitioners of uh, FMA that I've had the pleasure of training with or women, you know, that I respect women in general. I don't know. I think there's a line where uh, sex and advertising is, is fine, and I don't know. It, it, doesn't phase me, and this one seems to be a few steps over uh, on the wrong side of, of that line. And for example, here's a screenshot I took of a lady on the dumper uh, with a TFW, and, and I don't know, it just like there's things like this that I don't think are necessarily good in and of themselves, but then if you go on TFW's Facebook page and you read some of the commentary, uh, or if you're in some of the groups that uh, TFW posts these advertisements in, 
the conversations that result from them and how TFW has participated in those conversations has left me with kind of a pervy vibe and it makes me feel dirty and I don't, I just don't like it. I don't know that that advertising is helping and maybe it's just me. That, those are just my thoughts and I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to, to think the way I do. Maybe it doesn't bother you. Hell, maybe you think it is a selling feature and you really like it and you want to go give them your money. Speak with your money. Great. Do that. I'm not, I'm not telling you how to think. I'm just telling you my, my personal thoughts. And uh, I think it's worth sharing because the information is out there. Uh, it's something that's been done publicly. And to some people, it may influence whether you want to give this company your money uh, or not. And to some folks, they'll say, yeah, girls with swords. And they'll want to go and spend money because they like the idea that there's somebody out there that's not afraid to be politically incorrect. I, I kind of like that notion in, you know, in theory, just not in this particular application. Uh, in other cases, people might not be satisfied with it. It might be, you know, a compelling reason to spend their money elsewhere. Though if you're looking for a Kapilana, as we just discussed, I don't know how many other options there are. Anyway, that's really the things that come to mind. I'm sure there's probably a couple other, there's a couple other notable arguments that have come up with TFW, but I think those are the most pressing for me personally as a consumer. And again, as I'm not screenshotting any much of anything, it's, you know, I, I can just share with you what I think. And that's what I think and why I think it. Uh, if you have something to add to the argument, yay, nay, something, uh, throw in the commentary below so we can, again, all learn together as sword friends. And that's, that's all I have for you. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.